Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. My brothers, my sisters, it is your man, the Duke, host of the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast. And I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to www.strictlyfortheculture.ca. Strictly for the Culture is one of the hottest brands in sports and entertainment today. Come on. You've seen the t-shirts. You've seen the hoodies on folks like Rodney Mack, the Reverend Ron Hunt, Jeremy Prophet, MLW World Champion Alex Kane, Mr. PWI 500, Jay Bougie, even your man, the Duke, and a lot of other podcasters and influencers. So I'll say it once again, www.strictlyfortheculture.ca. Do it for the love. Do it for the respect. Do it for the honor. But most of all, do it strictly for the culture. You're locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Hey folks, this is James Beard, Hall of Fame referee, and you're listening to Duke Loves Wrestling. Close enough, see? All right. I, I, can't, I can't deal with you Yankees, all right? You, you guys <laughs> don't want to go with the Southern way. I get it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know. Brothers and sisters, you know James Beard is legitimately one of our beloved guests. Every time he's been on the show through the years, and, he, and he's an original guest. He, he was on Duke Loves Wrestling from year one, and now we're going into our eighth year. Just really a special person and has been a major part of the growth of this show not just from being on personally, but also for for lending his support and being someone that other people are like, okay, well, if James did your show, I'll do your show. Um, and, and I'll tell you, James, that is probably the biggest compliment that I could ever get, just the fact that you have uh, leveraged your reputation and your respect in the wrestling industry and have lended a little shine to you know a fan with the podcast like me, I, I really appreciate and dare I say, love you for it, man. It, 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 well, it's really I, special. I, so. I appreciate that Duke. And, and, and I, and I, the love is returned, my friend. And, and, uh, you know, I'm proud to be a part of it. it it's, it's a great service that, that you do. And, and, and I know the love you have for our business and, and that means a lot to me. And, and that's why I support this and why I support you. And, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we've talked on and off the air. So it's not just an on the air thing too. So it's a, it's a good relationship and I'm proud of it. It, it sure is. And I, I thank you for that, James, seriously, because it's funny. One, one of the best things that anyone's ever done, you shared some of your music with me, James. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I, I don't share that a lot with a lot of folks, but that's a uh, uh, part of that's because I'm, I'm technically an idiot, but, um, uh, yeah, that, that's part of my life, you know, that I'm very proud of. It. That That's a, a passion that I've had since I was just a very, very small kid and, and something I still continue to do a little bit. And so it's, it's a, you know, music's a big part of my life. Well, you got a pretty good singing voice there, James. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. You know, you, you, you might have missed your uh, your calling. You should have been on, on the <laughs> Opry or something there, brother. <laughs> well, you know, I thought I was headed that way and, and wrestling got in the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's so be it, right? You that's got bit so by the it. bug, and that was it. Yeah, that's it. it. Well, yeah, put the bug, and 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 somebody flashed a couple of opportunities in front of me. I couldn't turn down, and then there I go. You know, how many years now, James? How many years you been in the uh, industry? Th- uh, Thirty-seven, thirty-eight, something like that. If I uh, would have told you thirty-eight years ago, let's let's even say thirty-seven years ago. So let, let's say you're, you're you're just about one year in the business, mm-hmm. and I would have said to you, "Hey, James, give it another, you know, thirty-six years <laughs> or so, 
<laughs> and you're going to be even bigger than you have ever been. And that's after Hall of Fames. That's after JBL putting you in his book. That's after the run with the NWA. That's after all of these other accolades. That's after Japan and writing the book of the wrestling moves so that <laughs> the Japanese wrestlers can learn how to call a match in English. After all, Global Wrestling Federation and being on television all over the world and, and on ESPN, after all of these things that you've accomplished, your best days are going to be literally years and years down the line. If I would have said that to you, what would you say? It would have been kind of hard to believe, uh, you know, and, and, and I, when I look, I look back on all those things and, and, you know, I have been blessed. I really have. It, it's been, it's been a great ride. I've had a lot of great experiences. I've, and, and, you know, a lot of the honors and things have come in the last 10 years or so. And, and I thought that was, you know, that, uh, 10 years ago when I wrote that book, I thought I was kind of almost done. And some of the best things that's happened to me have happened to me in the last 10 years. And, and it's just, it's just incredible, you know, and, and, and uh, I, I'm, I, all I can say is I've been blessed. It's kind of crazy to say that because you, you, you kind of think to yourself, well, damn, do I need to write another book? <laughs> well, actually I am. There it and, is. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a, uh, uh, and I've told people this, but I keep telling them this for the last two or three years, I've had this book almost finished and I have actually, in fact, I have finished it. And then I started rewriting some things, but, uh, I, there will be a book out before this year is over with for sure. I love that. I love that because what, what better way to, uh, round the, the next book out than to talk about the fact that you are now a movie star. <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, a star may be a little bit extreme, but uh, actually, yes, being a part of a movie has been a, a, a that's just an amazing experience and, and something I, you know, I think we all kind of dream about that at some point in our time. You know, we, we, we think, you know, I'd love to be in the movies or, or something like that. And and uh, I, I, I admit that those things have crossed my mind over the years and that kind of thing. But uh, uh to actually have it happen is is uh, it's just mind boggling, folks. The name of the movie is Iron Claw, and it is the story of the Von Erich family, right? And it, it's it's interesting because obviously you have your your you know amateur wrestling historians and fans and what have you who well they didn't get this right and so and so is not tall <laughs> enough and that one didn't look like that and his nose isn't right and all this other nonsense which. Uh, good for you, uh, all of the, the nerds out there. And listen, I'm a nerd myself, so I get it. But good for you on your wanting everything to be historically the way that you remember it. Um, but I will say this. Far and wide, overall, even the critics who take issue with certain little details that they wish would have been slightly different. Overall, the reception for Iron Claw has been overwhelmingly positive like people really feel this was a, a great not a good but a great movie how yeah. does that feel that feels it, it's, it's really satis satisfying it's really it's a uh, uh it's something i hoped would would come uh, with, with this movie i i, I kind of had faith that it would because i could see the care that was gone into and and the and the quality of production that was that was uh, occurring during the, the making of it and, and the the time it took to get things right. I'm talking about the wrestling part, which is what I was involved in. Uh, I was hoping that, that it would be well received and, and uh, it's, it had, it's been as, as good as I ever hoped for. I mean, the, the reviews for the most part have been very, very positive and uh, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of being a part of it. Uh, I think Sean Darkman did an incredible job of, of writing the script and, and directing the movie and, and allowing uh, the, the the story to be as realistic as it could be and the, and the wrestling to be as realistic as it, it could be. Uh, I, I just I'm just really proud of being a part of that. I got to ask you, James, um, were you the right guy to to fill the roles that you fill? Because, like you said, you made sure that the wrestling part was as as good as it can be in those circumstances what have you and and you actually ended up on screen on top of it 
Well, uh, well, are you the yeah, right guy? Well, it wasn't wasn't much of a stretch for me. To be honest with you. <laughs> uh, I, I was hoping you were picking up where I was laying down. Yeah, man. yeah. You know, uh, I, I can't take any credit for for the quality of of uh, uh, of the actors wrestling. Although I was shocked at how well they they performed those spots and things. Uh, Chavo Guerrero was the director of wrestling, and and he put he put uh, Sean's version of things into action. And, and, uh, when I, when I got there, my, my cont- contribution was mainly, uh, kind of helping guide the guys into doing the, the, the things that they did in the ring, the way the guys actually did them in the ring, uh, because I'd had that experience with them. And, uh, and, and it was very, uh, uh it was very rewarding to see how they took to that and how, how, how willingly they were to take the advice and, and, and to put that advice into action. And, and it was these, these guys, these, these actors were unbelievably adept at doing the wrestling. It, it, when you see the wrestling scenes in the movie, that's those guys doing it. It's not some uh, a guy coming in and, and taking their place when the bump comes. They're they're going all the way through with it, and uh, and the whole spot is is all the actors. And and uh, I thought they did a magnificent job of it. Being a guy that is, you know, you're a Texas guy, and you are a referee in Texas. You were down in that territory. You got to to experience a lot of what was in the movie. You were there, mm-hmm. right? That's really what my role was uh, outside of actually being in the movie is to try to convey some of that to those guys. Did they do it? Absolutely. They, 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 they nailed it as well as anybody could nail it. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I, Zach was unbelievable to work with. You know, he, he, he wanted to, he wanted to bring the essence of Kevin to the ring and I think he did that. You know, Kevin was a very aggressive guy, and uh, uh, that was just his style. And and when we when I first got there, we were we started shooting some things or going over some scenes and stuff. And 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 he was a little hesitant to to jump in the middle of things. And uh, I talked to him about it, and and I said, look, you know, that one scene where the where the they rushed the ring with the free birds. There was some more stuff that we cut that after they got into the ring, the free birds are outside the ring and they have this back and forth thing and all. And, and, and Zach was kind of backing off a little bit, you know, and, and I, I said, I said, Zach, I said, Kevin would have run over me to get to those guys. That's how aggressive he was. And, and that, that's the attitude he took from that point on. It is that he tried to get that part of Kevin across and uh, and I think he did a great job of it, you know. But he, every time I tell I'd tell him something like that, or and not all those guys are that way. Um, the, the the all the actors that that portrayed wrestlers in in the in those scenes, when when we would give them suggestions, they would just they jump right all, on it. They weren't they weren't acting like a bunch of prima donna actors who, who thought that they were above all that. They they were actually respecting what we what we knew and how we knew it had to be done and, and tried to do it to their best ability. And I think for the most part, they got it, got it really right. Again, you know, you, you are somebody who 37, 38 years, uh, you spent in pro wrestling referee, executive mentor, trainer, you name it. You've done it all, man. Um, I, I often ask people on the show, what advice do you have for, you know, the, the younger generation or people who are trying to break into the business or whatever. But I'm going to I'm going to tailor this to you slightly differently, James. OK, because it, and, and I've seen this with, with even my mom, you know, 36 years. She was a, a law enforcement officer. Right. Right. She's seen it all, man. Different generation. She started off in the early 80s, just like you, just like you. Um, and then she retired a couple years ago. That's a lot of knowledge. That's a lot of change. That's a lot of adjusting lessons learned. Incredible amount, a wealth of knowledge uh, developed there, just like you. For anybody out there who has spent a lot of time in any industry and, you know, 
maybe they retired or they're just not out there as much as they used to be and what have you. For a guy who has managed to be bigger today than he ever was yesterday, do you have any advice for, for folks like that? Oh, wow. You know, uh, it, it's really hard to to re, to relate it that way sometimes because you're right things have you know things have changed so much in in the last three four decades uh and i'm sure your mother would say the same thing you know in her job that 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 change sometimes is very good there's a lot of things that have happened that have changed that are that are good but there there are a lot of things that have changed that that haven't been such a, a positive thing either and that's true in wrestling uh, I, I, I would, I'd like to tell younger, younger people, uh, you know, to, to find experienced people to learn from, uh, legitimate professionals to learn from and, and try to learn everything you can about the business, uh, in regardless of what role you're trying to be in. I don't care if you're trying to wrestle or a referee or be an announcer or whatever. I think you, I think you need to know as much about it as you, as you can. And that, that was the, that was the, uh, uh attitude I had when I got into the business. I, 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 I knew that being a referee was going to be my get to way. But I, that's not that was never going to be my only uh, avenue in this business, or at least I didn't want it to be. And as it turns out, it led me to do a lot of different things in this business, you know, whether it has to do with the creative side or or, uh, uh, you know, the TV and, and, and uh, training and, and just you name it. And I, I've been able to touch a little bit of every aspect of it. And, that, and that's really what I wanted to do when I started, but I couldn't have done that without listening to the right people. And, and, and that's, you know, that's the best advice I can give. I, I wish I could tell you that, that, uh, that things were the way they used to be, where it's just about uh, being really good and you're going to make it, but things are different now. You know, you, you, you don't have all the territories and opportunities that there were out that was out there once at one time you know uh at least not on a high level i mean you can work in this business on the weekends and and if you're happy with that that's that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but if you want to make it to the big time uh, there's only two or three paths to get there now or and and that's a that's a shame it's a shame that it's, it's gotten to that point, I think, because I, I believe that, that wrestling really, the, the diversity of it back in those days was probably the most appealing part. You know, you you, you just don't have that now. And and that's, I think that's that's sad to some degree. And I, I think, you know, and it's, I, I'm thinking about right, what you said about your mother. I think she'd probably say that about her job, too, that that there's a, uh, there's some restrictions there that, that probably she didn't have when she started. And, and that that are, that kind of keep people from being the best they could be sometimes or get, getting as far as they could get. And it, it's, it's a tough business. Uh, I can tell you that it's a tough business. And, and but you have to you have to listen. You have to you have to uh, apply what you what you learn and you have to respect uh, the people in front of you. And, and that's something I've always tried to do. And, and it's uh, it's served me pretty well. It served you pretty well, indeed. There's no question about that. So, so James, while we wait on your next book to be published, um, in the meantime, why don't you let everybody know the best way they can grab your first book? Well, I mean, you can still get it on Amazon. And, uh, and, and I have a lot of people that contact me on Facebook that want it. And, and uh, uh, if they, if they want it that way, they think, you know, we they can send a, send me their information and then pay and do it on PayPal and, and I'll sign it and send it to you. I, in fact, I just did that today with something with one. So, uh, I, it's, it's, uh, it, it's still available. Uh, after 10 years, I still get a lot of requests for it, especially from younger guys in the business. Uh, I think the, uh, the referee, the, the referee chapter in there has, has gotten me a lot of gigs, you know, as far as doing clinics and things, because it, it seems like it's kind of hit a, a, a nerve with a lot of people. And, uh, I wish things were the way they used to be so that all those things that I talked about in that chapter were so today, but, uh, uh, I still believe that's the way it should be. And, and I think that's the way it should be taught. So, you know, I think a lot of people appreciate that. 
The name of the book, folks, is The Third Man, My Life and Times Inside the Ring and Out. As James said, you can grab it on Amazon or you can reach out to James personally, what have you. He'll make sure he gets you fixed up, get yourself a copy of that book. I should say, too, uh, we're talking about that book, too. It's, it's just, it, it, a lot of people think you write a book and it's all about you, but it's really not. It's about most of my that book is mostly about the guys that I worked with, mostly in the Texas area and, and, and uh, uh, my relationship with them, including the Von Erics and the Freebirds and, and uh, all those guys that were around in world class, you know, Chris Adams and and uh, Gino Hernandez and, and Bruiser Brody. And uh, I mean, just goes on and on and on in my relationship with, with JBL, but that, that started and that kind of thing. And so it's, it's really about those guys and my uh, a relationship with them. It's not about me so much, but uh, this next one is going to be more about my experiences in Japan and, and, and the NWA and global uh, and, and a few more act chapters about some guys that I, I worked with like Eddie Gilbert and that, and, and that. So uh, it, it'll be a little bit different, a different uh, uh, take on this one. Well, and folks, I want to let you know right now, I'm, I'm trying everything in my power and, and he said he's thinking about it but i'm trying everything in my power to get james beard to start doing seminars online i think that for all of you promotions around the world and, and we cover you i mean all the way to china we cover australia we cover um for all you promotions around the world you may not necessarily be able to get james over to where you're at that way you know flying him out and all that good stuff that's that's pretty difficult these days with the way the airline industry is but if james could do it online i think it would be crazy for you not to tap into this wealth of knowledge that he has about the wrestling industry how to be a referee how to be an executive how to treat people with the proper type of respect but also guidance so that they can move on and become the next booker t the next jazz the next jbl because these are all people that James Beard has touched and helped mentor and help guide. And that's just a small portion. That's a minuscule portion of the list because it's far and wide. And even folks to this day, folks like uh, Layla Gray and Luke Curtis have even uh, been mentored by James and booked by James and what have you in recent years. I mean, so it's it's incredible when you think about all the lives that this man has touched. So if you could tap into James and have him do a seminar, even if it was online, I believe that would be worth it for everybody. So James, I'm going to stay on you about that. We'll see, we'll see what we can <laughs> well, do to make that happen. Well, it's, you know, it's really been kind of a, a, a passion of mine to pass it along and, and, and kind of pay it forward. And that's, that's, if that's a way to do that and, and, and it's a viable way, then I'm, I'm more than willing to, to give that a shot too. I, I, uh, I know that I'm always behind times when it comes to technology, but, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed doing clinics and, and, and seminars. And, and I tell people when I do those things, I said, look, this is, this is not a referee's clinic. This is, this is a wrestling clinic. Um, referees just happened to be something that I was mostly known for, but, uh, you know, and, and one of the first questions I ask guys when I, when I, I do those clinics, you know, I, I walk in there and I'll, I'll say, uh, you know, okay, uh, how many guys in here are workers? And of course, all the wrestlers will raise their hand. And, uh, and then some of the guys will be sitting there on their hands and I'll say, well, what are you guys? They say, well, I'm a referee or, and I'm going like, you're not a worker. And, 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 and that's been, that's been one of my things to try to get across to these guys is that, that a referee is part of a match he, or should be. And, and you're a worker, you just have a different role. And, and, you know, those are the things that I try to convey to these guys so that they understand that wrestling is a team sport and it's not an individual sport and, and referee is part of that team. So, you know, I, I, I try to include everything I can in, in, in these clinics that, that, uh, it's, it's not just about refereeing. It's about wrestling and and refereeing. And 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 uh, you know, as, as a guy who's trained a lot of people and worked in that that end of it too, uh, I think I can probably help the wrestlers just as much as I can the referees. 
Well said. Well said. Now, anybody who wants to reach out to you personally, James, what's the best way they can do that? Well, I mean, uh, I, I, I like you know me. I'm not a big social media guy. I do have I do have the uh, uh, accounts on X <laughs> and, and Instagram, but uh, and the Facebook, you know. And but if somebody contacts me, like a, a send me a message on Facebook, I'm always I'm always answering those. I'm not. I don't uh, ignore anybody and. And, and, you know, even if I don't know you, I'll, I'll, I'll at least acknowledge it and find out, you know, what, what, what it is you want. And if, if you're looking at something like this, then we'll definitely talk about it. And you can contact me through Texas Style Wrestling. That, that's another way to do that. Texas Style Wrestling. Okay. Now we're talking there in Texas. Where is that promotion based? It's a Dallas promotion. And actually, we've been, we've been uh, uh, doing our tapings in Addison, which is just a little little town right south, right in, in Dallas, really, basically. And it's supposed to have been a kind of a studio type situation. I started working with these guys a few months ago and, and, uh, you know, jazz and, and Rodney Mack are both a part of that. In fact, jazz is the one that, that kind of, uh, recruited me to, to come into this. And they were, they were looking for someone to help with the, the, uh, uh I guess the creative side of it, uh, the angles and the, and the formatting of the, of the tapings and that sort of thing. And, and I've gotten more involved in that recently and, and, and we're trying to get that back to, uh, uh, I guess adhere to the name Texas style wrestling, which is kind of known for hard hitting, uh, believable, real stuff, you know, I mean, th- th- something that you can watch and, and you really realize that it's, it, it looks like a competition. That's what we're shooting for. And we're getting there, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a good crew together. And, and, uh, I think our, our TVs or our matches are starting to show that. And, and of course with jazz and Rodney and Tim storm involved with me and, and, uh, and, and some other guys that, that I trust, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to try to make that happen. TSWplus.com. Texas Style Wrestling, yes. James Beard, Rodney Mack, Jazz, Tim Storm, Jesus. Literally the who's who, especially down there in Texas. Uh wrestling, my goodness. They're all my friends. You know, they're my they're my they're my family, not my friends, they're my family. Not just uh guest on the show, you're my family as well. And James, I just want to tell you, man, I love the fact that you continue to I don't want to say reinvent yourself, but you continue to, to keep yourself topical. And it is a joy to watch that because you're providing hope for everybody that, yeah, man, you can still do it. And, and, and all of the things that you do in life can matter if you allow yourself to continue to work together with others and, you know, keep yourself ready when opportunity knocks. Uh, James, you're you're an inspiration, and I, I appreciate you, man. And I can't wait to see what's going to continue well, to happen, not only in 2024 but beyond. Well, I, you know, it's it's been like I said, it's been a it's been a fun ride and an interesting ride, and 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 you, you, you're right. I think that uh, first of all, you become adept and 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 professional at what you do and 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 know your know whatever business you're in if it's wrestling and, and know everything you can about it. But but on top of that. Uh, treat people the way you want to be treated and, and, uh, and, and try to be honest and, and, and as fair with people as you can be. And, and, you know, good things will happen for you if you do that, I think. And, and I, I've, I've been very fortunate, you know, I, I, I was talking to, I think it was, it was John JBL. We were, we were just sitting around just having one of our, yeah, jabber sessions, you know, and, and, and I don't remember how the topic came up. But we we got to talking about guys getting booked and, and how they got it booked and that kind of thing. And and I sit there and realized at that moment, uh, I've never asked for a booking or anything in this business. Not, not a single time. I didn't ask to get in the business. I just kind of was pushed into it and put into it, however you want to put it. And, and since that day, I have never asked for an opportunity the, the not the Japanese thing, not a, not a booking at the sportatorium, not a booking anywhere I've ever been. It's just came. And, and I, I believe, honestly believe it's come because I've tried to do things the right way. You know, I, I, I've been very fortunate. Check out liquid IV. Listen, it's the holiday season, folks, and you and I both know hydration is paramount. 
Okay, if you want to get through the shopping, if you want to get through visiting the family and friends, the sports and live events, come on. Got to make sure you stay hydrated. And there's no better way that I know of than liquid IV. Okay, packed with B vitamins and all your other essential vitamins and nutrients there. Tastes great. You just take that hydration stick, you put it in a bottle of water, shake that sucker up and enjoy. I'm telling you, shop better hydration today. In fact, if you visit liquidiv.com right now, you'll save 20% on your entire order by using the promo code Duke Loves Wrestling. That's right. Duke Loves Wrestling. No spaces. Going to get you 20% off. What are you waiting for? Liquidiv.com. Enjoy. And now, let's get on with the show. What a fun conversation there with the Hall of Famer, the legend himself, James Beard. And it's it's interesting. You go back to the beginning of that conversation there. I, I don't call them interviews, folks. They're conversations, especially with somebody like James, who is such a big friend of the show and, and a friend of mine personally, someone who has been here from the beginning and has assisted in the success of Duke Les Wrestling. So that's that's not an interview. That's two friends having a conversation, catching up with each other. But it's funny, you know, James with his awesome Texas Southern accent there, right? And then you have me, the Boston guy, with my, I'm not going to call it a Boston accent so much as a, as a New England accent, because I, I actually pronounce my R's, so... <laughs> So you may not immediately know I'm from Boston from the beginning, uh, but you definitely know that I'm a Yankee, you know, some kind of northerner, what have you here. But it's funny for me to correct James and say wrestling, not wrestling, wrestling. And James trying to, you know, his media training. So he's trying to properly pronounce the word. It's wrestling. It was like, no, the name of the show is Duke Loves Wrestling. I could have edited that out, but I left that in because that was such a, a, a sweet, genuine moment amongst friends having a, a great intro to a, a, a deeper conversation there. And I said, you know what, let me, let me let folks in on little pieces like that because moments like that, you know, and, and really the, the totality of the conversation that James and I had, it is so easy to understand in a very short amount of time. You don't have to listen to James Beard speak for, for long before you realize why people like Tim Storm, you know, former NWA champion, multi-time champion, why uh, Jazz, Rodney Mack, JBL, countless other people in the entire wrestling industry from all over the world, mind you. It is not difficult to understand why once they become acquainted with James Beard, He's a friend for life. And these folks hold on to James. You heard JBL on this show talk about w what James Beard means to him and how important he was, uh, especially when, when JBL was making the transition from Global Wrestling Federation to finally getting his shot with the WWF at the time. You've heard Rodney Mack and Jazz talk about James and how he was so helpful, especially not only in the beginning of their careers, but even to this day, you hear it. They still do business together, right? They still find ways to continue to work together. Tim Storm, who I got to get back on the show at some time soon. Tim Storm is another early guest. Uh, he put James way over as well. Just about how how great of a friend James has always been to him. Dusty Wolf, the, you know, Rudy Boy Gonzalez who you heard in a previous episode when I had Dusty, Rudy, and James on at the same time. You know, we were we were memorializing the mad dog there. Uh but Dusty, I mean excuse me, uh Rudy and, and James, they their paths didn't always cross years ago. They kind of were missing each other, but they always knew of each other. And when they finally got acquainted with each other, that was it. Right? Friends for life. That's it. James Beard is a quality human being. Forget about referee. Forget about executive. Forget about wrestling mind. Forget about movie consultant. Forget about actor. Forget about singer. <laughs> Musician. Right? James Beard is a quality human being. 
And it's it's a different level when you're able to catch up with James. Um, the the quality of the conversation and how you feel just interacting with somebody like that. People talk about chicken soup for the soul. James Beard is chicken soup for the soul. He's a great person. Like not even he's not a good person. He's not a nice person. He's a great person. And he wears that on his sleeves. And it's very easy to tell. And it's just, it's cool, man. It's cool. It's cool to have somebody like that and be able to call a person like that your friend because legitimately he's a friend. No question about it. And everyone says the same thing about him. So that must tell you something there, right? So tip my hat to the legend James Beard, who legitimately is living his best life, right? He ain't going back and forth with you humanoids. He's living his best life. Okay. James is doing it, man. The whole movie thing, he's 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 about to put out his second book. He's definitely got a bunch of different opportunities in, in the form of bookings. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get James to start doing more web based seminars so he can be even more available to people around the world. It, it just makes sense, you know, and he has such an incredible take on wrestling as an industry. And he's able to not only help wrestlers, but help executives and help bookers, help people understand what pro wrestling is, what it should continue to be, and how you get there. And it's interesting because there's certainly a bunch of people who exist (laughs) in the wrestling industry who could use a James Beard to kind of help them, you know, get their head straight, for lack of a better term. And I'm going to I'm going to give my opinion on something and it's, it's probably going to upset some people. And I want to give a disclaimer here in no way, shape or form should any any uh, heat about what I'm about to say befall James in any way. But in my opinion, the reason why AEW continues to be on pretty unsteady ground and why they continue to uh, just be a caricature of what they should be considering all of the advantages that they have. They have a, you know, an unlimited budget. They got billionaires that own it. They managed to, to land on TV in the United States of America, cable TV on, on networks that traditionally carry pro wrestling. They have built a following wrestlers want to work there. Those are advantages. Those are major hurdles that most companies cannot get over. AEW has managed to accomplish that, which is great. The problem is, clearly, you don't have someone like James Beard available who can get through to the number one guy, Tony Khan, the president of the company, and help him understand that literally every single thing that he's doing right now is completely counter to sustaining and 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 really growing that company everything that he's doing right now is going to have an adverse effect and and we see it happening right we can go down the list of of, of just blunders man that get in the way of other positive things right it's a positive thing that they were able right out of the gate to be an alternative to the WWE in terms of a place where not only fans can watch different wrestling and, and see some recognizable stars and some young stars blended in, but also the wrestlers had a place where they could make some very good money and be on television and be on television that's distributed far and wide, right? Those are, those are advantages. Now, the disadvantage is when you have a guy who clearly doesn't understand that you you have to modernize, right? A lot of the stuff you see in AEW is just stubborn booking. I plan on making so-and-so the champion, and we're going to stick with that. We're not going to pay attention to the ebbs and the flows and what's working, what's not working. We're just going to make so-and-so champion and stick with that. It's nonsense. MJF, should he have eventually been champion? Sure. Should he have been champion as long as he as he has been? Absolutely not. Because you had nobody to feed MJF to, to elevate him. 
You had a bunch of tomato cans. No disrespect to anybody, but you guys weren't built in a manner that could make MJF's title reign mean anything. And 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 even though that's a that's an old school concept on how to book in pro wrestling, but still you got to modernize. Where are the giants who put MJF in trouble? Where are the various people of color who put MJF in trouble? Right? He doesn't need a partner. He doesn't need a faction. He should be getting beaten up by factions and, and partners and things of that nature. There's a lot of things that just completely ruin that title reign. But hey, it happened to Adam Adam Page. Hangman Page did the same thing. His, his title reign was so forgettable. If you ask most people to name the AEW champions, they usually miss Adam Page. They skip over him. They forgot that he was champion. Kenny Omega, who's supposed to be like the best wrestler in the world, according to a lot of people, his title reign wasn't much either. The most significant thing that happened in his title reign is that he and Tony Khan went to Impact Wrestling and buried that company, completely buried them to the point where they had to rebrand and go back to their old name because they're still trying to dig out of what they did to them. The fact that you're still only booking one women's match per television episode when you have a society in 2024 where we're talking about the pay gap between men and women and that shrinking. We're talking about the education and how women are, are literally leading in college graduates all over the damn nation. <laughs> you got countries around the world. Women are, are, are literally their prime ministers, their queens, they're, you know, they're in charge. Right? And, and you're still taking a whole bunch of talent and you're making it so they can only get one match per week on your television show. Meanwhile, you're featuring a bunch of guys who never were and never will be. Why? Why are we doing this? When you watch a show that James Beard's involved in, it looks a lot different. It looks competitive. It looks rough and tough. The storylines are pretty simple to understand. (laughs) It's entertaining. There are people in AEW who Tony Khan has access to who are veterans who know what they're talking about and who, who have a lot of success and what have you, but he ain't listening to them. Clearly. I think a guy like James Beard is somebody who can get through to Tony. I really do. I have a theory. I, I think Tony Khan like a lot of people of this generation. And again, I might offend some people by saying this. You don't want somebody who knows better than you. Not even talking about older. You don't want somebody with more experience letting you know that what you're doing is not the way to go. You immediately take that personally. You immediately take offense to that and you want to go the other way, right? When you listen to what some people talk about in terms of uh, Jim Ross, Jim Ross is a great example where here's a guy. And look, I, I got my problems with Jim Ross. I, I'm not always the biggest fan, but, but I respect what he's accomplished. And Jim Ross definitely knows the wrestling industry. And, and he's proven that he knows the wrestling industry. He doesn't know everything. He could, he could stand to modernize to a certain degree. But Jim Ross has forgotten a, a lot about wrestling than most of us will ever know. So let's just make sure we're clear on that. Jim Ross says he doesn't understand the whole Orange Cassidy thing. Doesn't make sense. Long term, this ain't going to work. Tony Khan pushes Orange Cassidy to the point where this guy legitimately is the most protected person in the company. And it's ridiculous because my question to that is, how the hell are you going to get a new TV contract? How the hell are you going to get fans to tune in? How the hell are you going to sell tickets? when? Your most protected wrestler is Orange Cassidy. And no disrespect to the wrestler himself, hardworking guy, I give him all the credit in the world. You have maximized all of your your abilities. You're literally outperforming what you should be at this point, right? So, So kudos to you, Orange. But brother, you are not a top guy and you're not gonna be a top guy even if they put you in the main event. The fans have have already proven they're not tuning in when you're wrestling. 
They're not when you're when you're on the card, they're not buying extra tickets to come see you. And partially that's because of the way you've been booked. Because it's unbelievable that Orange Cassidy would literally be this superhuman person who could beat everybody. It's in, it's embarrassing. And if you're going to do that, then just go all the way and make him the champion, right? If it's going to be a joke like that, then let's just go all the way with the joke. Let's make it so ridiculous that at least people will tune in to, to watch the guy eventually get destroyed by somebody, right? That could make sense. <laughs> it's just, it, it defies logic, some of this stuff. And, and, and on top of that, you got Tony Khan jumping online and acting like a crazy fanboy upset when people are calling him out as if you're not the guy who said that you you welcome the criticism and listen tony khan's been in my inbox talking crazy you guys know that so it's there's nothing new here this is who he is um but it's embarrassing how the hell do you find the time to do it (laughs) you should you should be working on a new tv deal tony your company still is not profitable you should be sitting down in, in, in under the learning tree of some of those veterans you got in that company, or at least, at least bring in a guy like James Beard and learn something. You got so much talent in that company. I, I would listen, I would take a guy like Will Hobbs right now and just have him break Orange Cassidy in half. Get that belt off of Orange Cassidy immediately. And then you can retell the Orange Cassidy story where he's going to try to work from behind and, and make it back to the top. Good for him. But you, you got to get Will Hobbs hot so that he could eventually challenge for the world championship. Right? Samoa Joe is the current champion now. How long is that going to last? The guy gets injured every other, every other year. Right? How long is that going to last? No disrespect to Samoa Joe. But does that even make sense? That's the best you could come up with. Come on, guys. Come on. You got you got Edge and Christian that they're just wrestling each other. <laughs> that's just <laughs> And I get that that may be what the wrestlers want to do, but I'm sorry, Adam Copeland, you should be wrestling some of these young guys in a real feud instead of feuding with friggin' Christian. Your buddy and, and by the way, no one wants to see you guys wrestle each other. They want to see you wrestle together against other people. How many more matches do you think Adam Copeland has in that body of his? We're wasting it on a feud with Christian? That quite frankly, is, as 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 impressive as the vignettes and the and the and the way that Christian is cutting his promos have been, this ain't working. This isn't translating into anything that's helping business. Why are we doing it? It's like, I, man, I'll tell you. A guy like James Beard, if you actually listen to him, he could correct a lot of this nonsense. Just, just in terms of explaining to you, buddy, this is not the way you do pro wrestling. It's not going to work. It's not working. <laughs> you can spend as much money as you as you want. That's not a successful wrestling company because you're not making money at the end of the day. Your bills are higher than what you're bringing in. It is what it is. And if I'm a TV company, there's nothing going on in AEW right now that would make me want to continue to invest or put them on my airwaves. There's nothing going on. Why would I invest in a company where their biggest black star, Jade Cargill, she immediately, as soon as she left that company, she did an interview in which she said she left the company because she wants to inspire young black and brown kids, and she did not feel she could do that in AEW. She said she wanted to wrestle the best women in the company at the top of the card, and she does not understand why she wasn't allowed to do that. She wanted to be in the world title hunt, not this made-up TBS title that you threw on her because the, because the network told you, hey, What's all this chatter about racism in your company? Huh? <laughs> we, we, we need a black champion. We need, a, we need a champion of color. So you made up a belt and you threw it on Jade and then disrespected her by, by never having her and Britt Baker ever touch each other, by never giving her a world title shot. She left the company because of that. Talked about the glass ceiling in that company. 
what t- what television network is going to invest in you after that? They're going to look at you like there's something wrong with you. And the worst part is nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. People talk about Swerve and how he's being quote unquote pushed. But the last time I checked, losing two straight matches to John Moxley, that's not a push. Telling him that he's going to go back and feud with Keith Lee, that's not a push. Having a competitive match with Dustin Rhodes at this stage in Dustin Rhodes' career, that's not a push. You're slowing the man down. Orange Cassidy, now that's a push. (laughs) That's a hell of a push that Orange Cassidy got going on. Eddie Kingston, he's got a push. Right? Samoa Joe got a push. Now he's champion. Those are pushes. I don't know what this thing with Swerve is. And and look, you know, I'm not a a fan of Swerve. He's a talented guy. But I I still think that if you're going to invest in anybody, especially a wrestler of color, at this stage, in order to make a statement, if you're going to put the company on anybody's back, put it on Will Hobbs' back. Muscled up, rough and tough, looks like he can beat everybody up. I don't have to suspend disbelief in order to understand if that guy just goes in, destroys everybody, he's champion. It makes sense. He's Brock Lesnar. You look at Brock Lesnar, there's no reason why anyone should beat Brock Lesnar unless they're almost somebody that big, right? If somebody, somebody gets a win over Brock Lesnar like Cody Rhodes did, it's because he literally had to run him over with a truck. Because that's the only way you're going to stop a Brock Lesnar. That should be Will Hobbs. And the fact that it's not defies logic. Doesn't make sense. Meanwhile, in WWE, they just put the North American title on this Obafemi guy who came out of nowhere, by the way, Nigerian. Uh, he he was a, a shot put champion in college, just built rough and tough and, and just huge. The guy is massive. And you look at him and there's, n- come on, there may be two or three people in the entire wrestling world who you would believe could beat Oma Femi in a fight, Right? There aren't too many people walking the face of the earth where you look at them and you say, oh, yeah, he could beat up Oma Femi. Oh, th- the guy just looks like somebody who can hurt somebody. He actually looks like Francis Ngannou to a certain degree, but he's much more thick than Francis. Francis is more cut. But you get my point in terms of the presentation. He just looks like a destroyer of worlds. So, of course, you put a title on that guy right away. You, you, you give him like a Goldberg push, which is what they did. He comes in, has a couple of matches. Immediately, you give him one of the titles. Now he's he's rising up the ranks, baby. That kid will be an NXT champion uh, before the year is over, unless he's already on the main roster beating the hell out of Cody Rhodes, which I am advocating for. I would love to see Obafemi destroy Cody Rhodes, put him in real danger, and have Cody have to figure that out. That's wrestling. It's simple. Big, bad, nasty badass guy you can book him as a heel but the fans are probably going to cheer him because he looks like a a legitimate fighter a legitimate destroyer of worlds Brock Lesnar it doesn't matter what Brock Lesnar does as a heel the fans are going to cheer him because they know that guy can really fight same thing with Bobby Lashley you look at Bobby Lashley you know he can legitimately kick everybody's ass because of that it doesn't matter what you book him to do as a heel They're going to cheer Bobby Lashley because at the end of the day, who doesn't like the baddest dude in the room? You may fear him. You may not like the fact that he can kick your ass, but it's still pretty damn cool. And because it's still pretty damn cool, especially when he's kicking somebody's ass, you can't turn away from it. You want to see it. Mike Tyson 101. Right? I don't get why it's so difficult for Tony Khan to understand the basic principles of booking pro wrestling. It is ridiculous. We got a lot of friends in that company. That company is putting food on their table and thank goodness for it. And Tony, I tip my hat to you. People, people, they got the lights on because they're able to work for you. Some of those folks, they never even had a shot at WWE. So the fact that you came along was a big deal because some of your, the other companies out there, 
like the NWA, for example, they don't pay well. MLW does not pay well. We got more wrestlers complaining about what they're getting paid and the, the, the crappy contracts that they get from MLW. They don't pay well. Impact Wrestling, eh, it's and Matsu, right? They're kind of in the middle. I hear they're getting better. AEW has a place. They matter. Don't get me wrong here. They matter. We need them. But Jesus, Tony, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it all. You're not going to get the TV contract with the way you're carrying on. You need somebody like a James Beard, and you need to listen to them. Buddy, that's not how you book pro wrestling, what you're doing right there. It doesn't make any sense. You don't take the 5'8 guy with, in the big boots who's cussing at everybody and throwing drinks on kids and really thinking that TV networks are going to want to invest in that. You don't do storylines where you got guys throwing quarters at him, hitting him with quarters and, and, and making fun of his Jewish heritage and thinking, oh, yeah, that's the thing that's going to work. What a fail that was. <laughs> what the hell? Who's on first here? I'm telling you, man. Just boggles my mind. People people get nervous when we talk like this because it, you know, the the idea is, well, hey man, if you if you point out the problems and you complain so much, that means that you're not really loving wrestling. That means that you're kind of hating wrestling and you know, that could that could do damage. No. No, 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 no. You identify what's wrong and you hold them accountable and you tell them to fix it. WWE was never perfect. A lot of the mistakes that Tony Khan is making, WWE have made them a million times over. But we stay on their backside. And they got the right people in place today. And thank God that, you know, with Endeavor owning them and TKO, it's a totally different company. But they buy into the modern era of how to conduct business. Women. People of color celebrate heritage. Uh, you know, don't poke fun at different cultures. Make cultures matter. Right? It's interesting. WWF, WWWF, when Bruno San Martino was champion, it mattered that he was Italian. They never, they didn't poke fun of, at, at his Italian heritage. They enhanced it. It mattered. Pedro Morales, right? Puerto Rican. They, it mattered. And then they started going in the, in the wrong direction with some of those stupid gimmicks. In the modern day, what a guy like Oba Femi can be Nigerian and you're not making him a caricature. He's just a badass. That's the way it should be. Tony Khan, there's no reason why you can't replicate, do it, Hell, you might even be able to do it even better, some of the talent you have in AEW. But it's not going to work out until you start listening to people who know far better than you ever could imagine to know. Getting off my soapbox there. Duke Loves Wrestling on Facebook, on Twitter, DukeLovesWrestling at gmail.com. Let me know what you think. You know, I, hey, look, if I don't say these things, then I'm complicit. And I refuse to be complicit in the nonsense. Duke loves wrestling. And in order to express the love and to, and, and to make sure that I'm contributing to the solution, I got to call out the nonsense. Can't just sit here and pretend like it's all rainbows and lollipops. No, got to call out the nonsense. And you offer solutions. A guy like James Beard is a, is a solution to the nonsense. You hear the guy talk, you know it. Read his book. Third Man. Great book. Anyway, I got to get out of here. As always, folks, be kind to yourselves and be kind to others. This guy gets a lot of heat <laughs> for, for being the voice at the end of my show every week. And I leave it up there because I just think it's hilarious. Uh, so without further ado... Take it away, Tony Schiavone. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're definitely out of time on Duke Love Wrestling.